doing a very quick video showing a new build I did of the K3NG heater. Uh, from my last video, you, this is my uh, my first build. This was based on an 18 mega 328p chip. And I found because of the memory constraints, I really couldn't um, enable all of the features that I wanted, specifically the CLI uh, macros and um, and support for logging software that's uh, that's available in in the uh, in the code. So after fooling around with this, and this works quite well, but I had to strip down the um, feature set quite a bit. I decided to build a more full featured set based on the um, Arduino Mega board and I ordered one from Amazon. You can see here on the back of this Adafruit, Adafruit case. Um, this case is designed to mount either, actually it was designed originally for the Arduino Uno, but it also accommodates the, um, the longer form factor of the, of the Arduino Mega. This is a cheap Chinese clone. That I think I got for like $12, an incredible deal. So it's got tons of memory and more importantly, tons of SRAM or, or um, RAM memory. Part of the problem was I was running out of RAM, I think, on the on the older build with the single uh, 328p chip, which is what the Ar Arduino Uno is based upon. This thing is runs at the same 16 megahertz clock rate, but it's um, got tons more memory, a lot more I.O. and so forth, a lot of which I'm not using. So I put it in the bottom of the case, screwed it down, and then I had to figure out how to get everything squeezed in here. So this case already accommodated a 16 by 2 LCD, so that was pretty easy to accommodate. I had this idea of using a telephone keypad in place of discrete buttons for the individual memories. So what I did is define 10 memories, and this is kind of a unique keypad in that each one of the buttons uh, closes an individual circuit with a common ground. So each one is actually a, a single pull, single throw, normally open push button switch. Unlike most telephone keypads, which use a row column matrix scheme, which requires special software for scanning. So it lends itself very well to the uh, resistor encoding, single pin uh, encoding system used by the K3NG here. And it worked out really, really well. So I cut a square hole in the top of the case. Not the best job. The uh, clear case shows my uh, all my boo-boos and everything, but it's kind of interesting. So I, uh, as you can see, the Atmeg is in the bottom, and I built a little shield that has all of the interface hardware, and you can see that on top of the Mega there a little bit. So I took a piece of proto board, soldered in some headers, and then figured out where I wanted the pins to go and built up all of the bypass capacitors, keying circuits, and so forth on that. So that worked out nicely. Then on the bottom, this already has the slots cut in for the uh, power and the USB port. Uh, K3NG recommends using a or cutting the little software reset jumper on the inside of this and possibly adding another reset button. What was happening was, was when I would uh, activate a terminal program to use the CLI, it would reset the board. After cutting the jumper, it does not do that any longer. And um, I can hook it up to the, uh, to the um, Telnet session. I use um, Putty for that. Hook, hook it up to that session, hit the reset button, and it immediately uh, jumps into the... Um, into the routine. More importantly, apparently the logging software does not like that software reset and um, K3NG is recommended in several places to cut it and put the button in or maybe use some other method. So the reasons for that aren't entirely clear. It does work better with the CLI. As I get into using the logging software, I think I'll understand that a bit better. I have three jacks on top. The first jack is for the paddle, so it's a stereo jack. The second one is a mono jack for the keying output. There's just a single output here. And the third is an input, a mono input, for the uh, CW software decoder that uh, is built into the code and can uh, decode um, CW, receive CW. I have the uh, bandwidth and the center frequency set up in the gertzel.h file to be sort of nominal and match the uh, side tone on my rig, my main rig. 
On the back here, you can see I've got a tiny little thin speaker, not too well centered on that hole, but glued to the front panel of the case. See the guts of the jack, and then I have a knob here. You might think that's the CW speed control, but it's actually not. So level control uh, for the uh, CW decoder. So when you plug in a mono source, you can adjust the level downward from whatever level you have it set to. I found with my transceiver, if I'm trying to receive CW using the decoder, um, it did not work extremely well. I, ha I would have to turn it down to the point where I couldn't comfortably hear it uh, for the decoder to work. So it was, um, what, I, what I decided to do is put this volume control on so I can continue to operate or listen at a comfortable volume while still keeping the uh, decoder input level happy. So that, that's worked out real well. Tiny little pot there, uh, wired into the uh, jack to act as a simple level control. Uh, linear taper, because it's not designed for human hearing, it's just designed for a level control into the interface circuit. So, all in all, worked out really well. So, let me plug it in. I did have a couple of very nice 16 by 2 displays. I don't know how well this will show up. Now, I did notice, even after cutting that reset pin, the bootloader still takes its customary 8 seconds on the first initial boot to come up. And it seems that the power on reset always goes directly into the bootloader and causes that initial delay. But thereafter, if I were to hit the reset button, It, it does really an immediate immediate reset without it without any issue so um, here I've got a um, I've got a telnet session up you can see I was decoding some code now I see an error message that there was an error reading from the uh, serial device so what I'll do is I will reset the session with a restart session command and then I'll hit the Reset button on the keyer. And there you can see that uh, it reestablished the connection into the um, into the CLI. And thereafter, you know, everything works works normally. So whoops, didn't want high mode, I wanted um, help, which is a question mark. So you know it works great. And um, all the commands work. The uh, I can type in and hear the Morse code. So you can type. There's a pretty good type ahead buffer. I think it's about 150 characters. So all working really, really nicely. Really happy with it. Uh, now to show the decoder, I've got actually on my computer. I'm receiving a um, I'm receiving some CW, it's actually the W1AW code. There's the server that streams the uh, CW over the internet. And the audio frequency of the W1AW stream actually matches the center frequency of the Gritzel detector. So what I'll do is go down here, and I've um, got the gain all the way turned down. Here's the... Um, input jack, which I'll plug into the input, and then I will advance the um, advance the control until I start seeing some, some decodes, which I'm not seeing. So I think probably what has happened here is that the uh, stream has tied down. No, it's still coming in. So let's see, what do we got here? Well, Plug the panel into my audio input jack, so that is likely the problem. So here is the audio input jack. Turn it down. Plug that in. You can't see them, but inside the transparent case, I've got a green LED for the signal to detect. And then I've got a red LED here for the uh, command mode indicator. I have the star and the pound key both wired to act as command modes and then I have 10 memories to find. 1 through 10. 0 is number 10. So these push buttons act as push button activation for, for those memories. 
can see I'm, it says program memory one, which I'm not gonna do. Program memory two, three, four. You can see there's very little bounce on the buttons. They work really nicely. Just showing that they actually do work. There you go. So um, very convenient and more memories than I'll probably ever need. So let's go out of command mode since the decoder does not work. And I will advance the uh, gain control. So we see a, there we go. So we see the flashing of the light and which is following the code. And if you look there, you can see after a few seconds, it locks onto the rate. And uh, looks like I need a little more gain. There it goes. Interestingly, it, if I don't have enough signal, it seems to drop the display of the gap between words for some reason. So some anomaly with the decoding routine, but it actually works extremely well. Of course, this is a very undemanding um, very undemanding application or source of CW because there's absolutely no, you know, fading or any kind of static or noise or anything on top of it. So, trying to see if I'm overdriving it. I think I am actually. So let's go right down below the level where it starts and just advance it about an eighth of a turn. So you get the idea, but it works pretty well. It seems to be missing spaces for some reason. I don't have the speaker connector. I could listen to kind of see and optimize the game here, but pretty happy with how that works. And I got, again, that little LED down here. Also the decoded uh, code is displayed on the, um, on the Telnet window as well. So if I, Full screen that you can see is the as it's being decoded, it'll come in through the uh, and be displayed on the CLI as well. Uh, the box down here, FYI, is just an aircraft receiver, radar receiver I have hooked up on the roof that picks up uh, position information from airplanes uh, that that are broadcast on the radar frequencies used by air traffic control, and that gets displayed on a map so I can actually track the air traffic. This little antenna on the roof, kind of a cool thing. Subject for another video. So anyway, very happy with this. Um, it took a little bit of work to get it all packaged up, but the telephone keypad concept worked, um, worked pretty well. I'm pretty happy with it.